think. Act and prosper. You are now tuned into the Money Level Show. Hey everyone, welcome back to the Money Level Show. It is your host, Daryl Dominic, and today we're going to think, act, and prosper. Today I got the man himself, Mr. MC Jen, who has been a childhood uh, idol of mine. You know, I used to grow up, uh, grew up watching him on uh, 106 in Park and was like, oh man, this kid is killing it, you know? Uh, and, um, <laughs> and, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm too much younger than MC Jen. You know, I was probably like around 17, 16, 17, watching them on TV, 106 in Park, and then watching the, the Learn Chinese. Uh, I remember that. <laughs> Took the uh, he took the bag of food to the door. He was like, "These days are over." You know, yes. I, I remember that. You know, and um, <laughs> that was that was a, a a real you know time in my life where where I was able to like just really connect with hip hop and stuff. So you were a big influence in that. So uh, everyone just want to welcome MC Jen today. So how you doing, man? Daryl, man. Hey, uh, it's, it's an honor. That was a great intro. You know, that was a great <laughs> that was a great intro. That was a, a, oh, a yeah, legit, yeah. <laughs> of all the, um, I'm always, I'm always on edge when people say, all right, so before I bring you on or before I bring you out, I'm just going to say a few words. Cause you know, you never know what those few words could be, but uh, I got to yeah. give you credit. I think you're the first one to actually specifically reference the, the, the video, the opening of the learn Chinese video where I take the bag of rice and I'm just like, these uh -huh. days are over and I slam it on the ground. <laughs> right, <laughs> Thank so, you so for we, having we gotta me, man. We got to ask a question. Ask a question. Did, did someone yeah. eat that bag of food, uh, the bag of I rice? Don't believe, after, after I don't that. believe so. There's actually, okay, okay. Uh, <laughs> it didn't it didn't make it in the final version of the music video, but I remember doing a take where after I threw it on the floor, uh, me and the director was talking. And I was like, yo, what if I like stomp on it too? Like, what if I stomp the bag out and just really yeah, yeah, like yeah. commit? <laughs> just, and they didn't use that version, but yeah, I don't think anybody ate that after that shot. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> got you, got you. So yeah, so today, uh, everyone, I wanted to bring Jen on, um, you know, as since I've been doing this podcast, we, we talk with different people um, that have been at different financial levels, different uh, mm -hmm. entrepreneurs and people that mm -hmm. uh, do different things for careers and things like that. You know, I just want to make this just real for the audience. You know, I don't want to just make it like something where people can't connect. And so uh, me mm -hmm. being a music artist and you being a music artist, you know, and, and we're not going to talk fully about music today, but um, just the entrepreneur side of music. You know, I've coached a lot of kids um, kids that want to become a rapper someday. And I, and I asked them, yeah. you know, what do yeah. they understand about business? You know, yeah, that's, that's a big part of, of hip hop. That's a big part of being an artist. You're your own entrepreneur. You got your branding, you know, all those yes. different things. And so, yes. and so I kind of just wanted to check in with you just to see, uh, you know, what, what were some of your challenges as a young music artist, you know, being an entrepreneur, uh, I don't think you, you weren't signed when you went to 106 and park, you know, you Correct. were kind of just Correct. jumping out there, right? You just jumped yes. out there? Yes. So, um, man, great, just great, insightful question. And I think it's dope that you are creating this platform to, to engage with people like this. So for me, um, there definitely was a learning process in real time. So just to put a little bit of back story and a bit of context to it, like, you know, I didn't come into the game, so to speak, under anybody's tutelage, or I didn't have a uh, a mentor or a business mentor or a, a a some figure who basically was able to guide me in terms of the all of the things you just listed, the financial aspect, the the marketing aspect, all of those things. So in essence, I just learned it all in real time. So if I if I were to define or pinpoint one moment, let's say when I was 15 or 16 years old which is a critical moment. Cause I think by 15, 16, you know, the initial days of high school, I was dead mm -hmm. set on the fact that this is the direction I'm going. I'm going to get into the music industry game. I'm going to get me a record deal. I'm going to get the check. The money will come. The fame will come. The girls will come, you know? Yeah. So <laughs> I, I say that to say very standard form, uh, very on par with what a 15 and 16 year old would map out their life to look like, right? So mm -hmm. as I got older uh, in the following years, right? Even getting into young adulthood, 
uh, 18, 19, all the way up until, let's, uh, you, you, you referenced it right out the gate, the 106 in Park, which would be my big break. Like w without a doubt, that's my big break. So, you know, maybe some people didn't learn of me until that moment, seeing me on BET. Uh, I was about 19, 20 years old at the time. Yeah, the, like this is 2001. So yeah, I was 19 actually. Um, but what they don't know is prior to that, as I mentioned, 15, 16, I had already been on this path. So in my mind, mm -hmm. I have spent, in my mind, I have spent like five, six years in the game already to me, right? Because I'm like, yo, at 15, 16, I was recording demo tapes, performing at the local talent show and just trying to get on. But uh, I think it was a, a, definitely a wake up call for me when I did sign my first record deal, which uh, was on the heels of 106 and Park. I signed with Rough Riders and yeah, money came. Money came mm -hmm. and it came fast. And um, you know, I don't think it's necessarily about getting into the figures, but I think it's more about just the notion of it came. And to be honest, I don't think it was as high of a priority for me as it should have been in terms of how to navigate that uh, yeah, in terms yeah, of, definitely. in terms of, in terms of like, yo, okay, you are making bread now. And not only that, but God has basically blessed you in such a way that you're doing exactly what you want to do. Your childhood dream. Mm -hmm. You dreamed of getting yeah. a record deal. You dreamed of the, the notoriety, the fame, the money, and it's literally all being presented to you right now. So, so God definitely was favorable and gracious in that way. But at the same time, I think that he left some space for me to, to make mistakes and, mm -hmm. and, 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 and encounter pitfalls. And I, I don't even know if I would call it a pitfall, but I will say that for a large part of the early part of my career, there literally was no, um, there was no discernment and there was no wisdom in this particular area and i'm talking about finances so mm -hmm. so it was a learning yeah, process i had to learn as i as i navigated through it yeah 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 for sure for sure and and uh at that time um was dmx he was uh was he he was something with rough riders correct yeah correct. correct so okay. so i grew up a hardcore i know we're like we don't want to dive deep into the music yeah, aspect yeah. of it but it's cool to put a little bit of context in it so i grew up a hardcore rough rider fan so when I was like 17, 16, right, I, I, I copped the DMX albums, the Rough Rider Volume 1, Rough Rider Volume yeah, 2, yeah, yeah. Eve, <laughs> you know, the uh, Swiss Beats, of course, was the, musically, Swiss Beats was the, the spearhead of all of this, right, musically. He was producing basically everybody's joints, uh, at least mm -hmm. within the Rough Riders camp. So um, I went to the Rough Rider Cash Money Tour, you know, when I was a high school senior. So it's kind of interesting how it came full circle because when I did officially, you know, sign the, 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 that line and become part of Rough Riders, I was like, yo, I'm literally a, a signing with a label that was one of my childhood, you know, like childhood, like fantasy labels to sign with. However, mm -hmm. uh, I did come on at a time where not so much that the label was disbanding, but I did come off on at a time when literally every one of those names that I just mentioned, they were venturing off. So meaning yeah. simultaneously that I joined the fold, DMX launched his label. Eve actually, at one point, Eve went and signed with um, Dr. Dre. Yeah, he, she signed with Aftermath. Mm -hmm. so, so there was a lot of transitioning going on. Uh, Swiss started a label, uh, Full Surface. Um, even um, uh, uh, Jada Kiss and Sheik and Styles and uh, this is real hip hop talk now, right? But yeah, they yeah, started definitely. a label, you know, they started D Block. Everyone was just venturing off. Like, and I looked at it as, all right, I'm the new kid on the block. I'm the little, the little brother, right? Uh, that's, you know, or the little Chinese brother that's been adopted into the family. And I just, I didn't, I didn't dwell on it too much. Like I didn't dwell mm -hmm. on it as, dang, why is everybody going off now that I'm here? I was just like, all right, everyone's, you know, they're, they're, they're venturing off. The older brothers and sister are venturing off to do their own thing. Um, and I'm just here to make my own mark, you know? Yeah, yeah. definitely. Definitely. So, uh, so hip hop, you know, is, is fueled by a lot of materialism, you know, uh, facts, and, facts. And, and like a lot of like, you know, cause even a lot of, a lot of kids I worked with and even myself as a kid, you know, I yeah. used to just, you know, like, Hey, I need the new J's. I need the new, you yeah. know, hey, I need to get this chain, I, you know, and, yeah. and it probably wasn't even fully gold, you know what I'm saying? Like stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. like, 
and yeah. and that's a lot of money you know to be putting out yes. there for materialism versus like you know if you were you know investing that in in you know in uh, amazon stock or something during that time you yeah. know what i'm saying like like yeah. you know so what 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 do you feel like was your relationship with money during that time you know and and how kind of hip-hop culture influenced you uh in your decisions during that time wow uh even just listening to you kind of prompt the question a, a billion thoughts run through my head and what's fascinating to me is how it really is a lot of aspects of my life that are intertwined here you're talking about hip-hop but just by instinct i started thinking about just my own childhood upbringing uh and as it relates to my parents and yeah, it could seem like it's such a far off topic, but it is all intertwined because, you know, my mom and dad, they're, um, you know, immigrants to America. So me, my sister, were pretty much first generation, so to speak, right? We were the first mm -hmm. generation of our family that was born here in America. But my mom and dad came here and I think, you know, very uh, mm -mm -mm, textbook type story in the sense of they came here and forget about like, yo, we want to come here and build an empire and, and gather all our riches. I think the the initial sentiment was just, we just want to be able to provide for our family, build our, build mm -hmm. build something sustainable for our family. Um, and in our case, it was the Chinese takeout restaurant, right? Like I've shared about it in my music. I've talked about it in, in the TED talk that I did. Uh, I basically grew up in that environment that every city in America or every city in the globe, really, you know, like that's, I'm talking about outside of Asia, that's not in Asia, because in Asia, it would be standard, but meaning you could go to any city in the country, and you'll be able to find that one Chinese takeout or probably more than one, but that one takeout Chinese restaurant, the small joint, you go inside, it's probably the mom at the counter, the dad's mm -hmm. in the kitchen cooking, and then the kids are running around, right, doing their homework. That was me all the way up yeah. until I was like 12 or 13, because at that point, I'm the one at the counter, right? I'm answering the phone. So I think that experience played a big part in your question of what did the, the hip hop uh, element and the materialism and, 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 and the, the, the drive of, we got to make the most money, we got to have the freshest J's, we got to have the nicest whips. Like how did that all connect? I think for sure there was a connect because you know, to be honest, when I first got exposed to hip hop, um, I just loved the, the, the art form of it, to be honest, mm -hmm. you know, um, and I say that, you know, like wholeheartedly, but without a doubt, the themes definitely resonated, I think. And when we say the themes, I'm talking about just, you know, overall themes of like wanting to be um, wanting to be received and wanting to get props and wanting, you know, you want the guys to want to be like you and you want the girls to all want you. Right. And, yeah, and, and yeah. for the most part, that is a reoccurring theme in hip hop. Now we know as like actual, you know, like students of it, that it's so much more than that. Right. We know that hip hop can be something that you can use for introspection, for elevating your mind, for uplifting mm -hmm. your community. It's all out there. You know what I mean? And the best yeah. artists are the ones that encapsulate all of that. So you listen to someone like Nas, you know, Nas will give you the joint that's like, you know, like, that's more like, yo, we just fly braggadocious, you know, ooh, chi wally wally, you know, like probably not the most edifying yeah. and not the most uplifting, but Nas will also give you if I rule the world. Same thing with pop, you know what I mean? So for me, you know, not to stray too far away from the original question, I think I did pick up a lot of these mentalities from 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 what I was listening to. Right. Um, you know, you listen, you grow up listening to Jay-Z, to Nas, to Wu-Tang, to, to Biggie, to Snoop, you know, East, West Coast down. I mean, I grew up in Miami, so we, we listen to Trick Daddy. You know, we listen to, you know, a, a variety of stuff. And yes, the reoccurring themes are more money, better. You know, the, 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 the flyest whips, the flyest chains, the flyest, all of that, you know, and um, there was definitely a season where I had to navigate within myself, like, where do I really feel? Or where do I really align with these matters? Like, is money the most important thing to me? Um, and, and I think uh, it's still a process now, but I definitely have a lot more clarity mm -hmm. than ever. That's good. Yeah. That's yeah. good. So yeah. 
you know, I, I view music, you know, as a business and, you know, you have the independent side and then you also have the side where you're signed to a label. Um, and, you know, being independent is like running your own business, running your own company. Yes. You have yes. to you know, fund a lot of stuff or obtain funding, you know, for a yeah. lot of different things. Yeah. Uh, so for you, so you being from Miami, uh, one piece of it is you move. Did you move to New York after One Six Apart? Yeah, I um, it it was uh, it was partially my own personal ambition, uh, combined mm -hmm. with family circumstance. So what happened oh, okay, was okay. in yeah. So what happened was in two thousand and one, after the nine eleven incident, and it's just always. I, I mean, I I kind of have to reference nine eleven because it's so intertwined. So basically, the months following September, like October, November. Uh, there was this big discussion within my household of uh, moving from Miami to New York. And I remember the first person to really make the move was my, my pops. My pops was like, I'm going to go up to New York first, get a vibe, and then we'll decide if we all want to move up to New York together. So when it was said and done, you know, my mom and dad said to me, hey, look, you're not a kid, right? You're, I think, I, yeah, I was like 19 at the time. So they basically said, you can stay here in Miami or uh, join us. We're all basically relocating up up north mm -hmm. to New York. And it was a no-brainer for me. Number one, I, I couldn't see myself being apart from my family that uh, in that circumstance. Combined with, at that time, I was like, if I'm really going to make this music thing pop off, it's going to be in the Mecca, you know, the, the birthplace yeah, yeah, where it all started. So, um, mm -hmm. so, but the good thing is the transition was somewhat, um, you know, uh, I was able to kind of get right into the groove because actually growing up throughout my childhood, I spent a lot of summers in New York. I spent a lot of time in New York. So pretty much uh, all the way back to like seven, eight years old, I pretty much spent like every summer in New York with my grandma, my grandpa, uh, who lived in Chinatown, not too far away from the World Trade Center, mm -hmm. actually. Yeah. 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 So, so you ended up you know, going independent at some point, you know, I kind of followed your journey. Uh, yeah. Yeah. You know, when you went to uh, Hong Kong, you know, I, I was watching some of your, uh, your music videos in uh, Cantonese. In Cantonese. Like, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I was, I was kind of <laughs> like, I'm like, I don't uh, know what he's saying right now. They got the subtitles on the screen. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. 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 You know, yeah, yeah. It, it sounds good. And so, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. so when, when you were pursuing that, you kind of took a shift, you know, obviously, you know, you, you found God and, and you found Christ. Um, yeah. But from a business standpoint, what, what kind of were you thinking, like uh, how you had to shift? Because uh, I don't know how you how everything ended with Rough Riders or whatnot. But yeah, I know that yeah. you as an artist, you had to shift and kind of just figure out what's next. And so what, how, can you explain a little bit about that process? Totally. Um, I think the 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 one word that I cherish and I think really can capture what that whole process looked like uh, is organic. It all happened mm -hmm. very organically. And that means everything to me. Uh, so just to kind of like, yeah, just to walk down the timeline, I signed with Rough Riders in 2002, basically around the 106 in part time. I stayed with them pretty much uh, for the next four years. So it wasn't until 2006 that I formally and officially parted ways with them. 2006, yeah. So we released one album. So I signed with them in 2002. My first album didn't come out till two years later. So my first and only one album with Rough Riders came out in 2004. So even after that album came out, I still kind of like, you know, I, I, I rode, I, I, I tried to ride it. I tried to rough ride it out for a bit. And mm -hmm. uh you know, just to see what, what, what the next thing would be. But then we were, we arrived at a point where between myself, my manager at the time, as well as the CEOs of the label, you know, there was a mutual feeling of, you know what, we gave it a shot, you know, everyone, you know, let's, we started positive, let's end positive too. And we just all mutually agreed to part ways. So yeah, to, to lead into the question of the whole transitioning into an independent type of mindset, it happened organically. So in 2006, mm -hmm. uh, you know, when the, when the dust cleared and it was official that I wasn't with Rough Riders no more. And even that, it was a tricky thing to navigate because to the general public, you know, the, the more sensational and the more um, 
the more buzzworthy way to, to look at it was, yo, you heard Jin got dropped from Rough Riders, right? So there was mm -hmm. that too, you know, because they're just looking at the surface of it. Like, yo, he dropped his album. The album didn't do nowhere near what, you know, we all thought it would or what Jin even claimed it would do. And yo, they dropped him, right? So it was me having to internally and externally navigate that. Um, but I, uh, you know, I, I'm grateful because at the time, the one thing that I could turn to was my creative output. So what happened was um, still my then manager at the time, who I'm no longer with now, but my manager at the time, we, you know, we, we were still, we still was on the same page about things. So I was like, yo, I'm gonna go to the studio and just get back into that mindset, right? So the first album I recorded was um, uh, very like, this is post Rough Riders, and this is where mm -hmm. the independent thing comes in. Um, yeah, I went straight back to the roots, right? Like straight back to backpack gin, you know, let me get back to really the craft of it. And I recorded an album called Propaganda, not propaganda, but propaganda, P R O P E R. Mm -hmm. And gotcha. yeah, we straight up and we straight up dropped that independent, like straight up, like, um, you know, uh, took money out of our own pockets, booked a studio, no backing, no distribution, no label, no nothing. Uh, recorded the album and then we did actually um was able to source like a very small indie distributor and and they helped us distribute it now this is obviously a huge shift i know we're talking about money levels we're talking about finances mm -hmm. this was a huge shift for me because the album prior to that i was basically within the the tradition like as traditional as can be huge record label system you know i'm signed to rough riders but my distributor is virgin records uh and there's all these different components you know there's like budgets and you know the budget comes from the distributor it's got to be worked out with a label and then okay this amount goes to marketing this amount goes to radio promotion this amount goes to paying off producers this amount goes off the music video shoot so i went from all of that to with the propaganda album it was just literally me, you know what I mean? Like with mm -hmm. maybe like a, 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 a very rough spreadsheet, you know, like, all right, this is how much money I got to do this whole thing. You know, we got $6,000. How much can we spend on the studio? How much can we spend for 12 beats? You know, <laughs> how much can we spend for maybe one flyer, like one poster that we can press up a thousand of and just tape onto the walls of, of New York City ourselves. It's so grind, it's a complete grind, yo. It was a completely different scale. And, um, you know, I, I think um, it, it was eye opening to make that type of shift. And at the time, a lot of people didn't really understand it, too, because, you know, they felt like I was working backwards. It's like, yo, you was with Rough Riders. Now you're going back to, you know, this like it's such a big shift. But I mean, let's be honest, D, like you got to do what you got to do, you know, and I think I'm mm -hmm. grateful that I was able to overcome my own my own hurdle. Right. Of not feeling like yo, how's this going to look to the masses? You know, it's like, yeah, before we saw Jin on 106 in Park and BT had his music videos, you know, now he's, you know, he, 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 he's on the corner basically with a flyer, like, yo, check out my album, yo, I got this dropping, I got, you know, so it, it was a refining process for me too. And then the album after that, um, you know, so I dropped that propaganda album and then like another year or so later, a year or two later, I dropped another album. This was even a bigger shift technology really started to come into play. I basically recorded an album and sold it straight up on my MySpace. Cause this mm -hmm. was this was the MySpace era. And I think I was lucky because I was very active and very proactive with building out my MySpace platform. And you had people that were still kind of rocking with me, right? So there's just like, yo, this is Jen from 106 and Park and Too Fast, Too Furious. So my MySpace page was getting a lot of traction. And uh, I was like, yo, they're right here. These are my consumers. If I were to drop an album, these would be the people that would go buy it. Like they obviously rock with Jin and not with the idea of Jin the rap star. You know what I'm saying? Like because the, everybody knows at that point that I'm not with Rough Riders no more. I'm not popping, quote unquote. Um, so I basically recorded an album and on my MySpace page, I just posted a, a bulletin or like a, a post saying, hey, I got a new album. If you want to buy it, just PayPal me 10 bucks. And uh, I'll mail it to you just straight up like that. Yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, once again, without needing to go into like, yo, how many did you sell? Or, you know, what was the numbers? Like, I'm saying like, it worked. Mm -hmm. Like there's people so, out there 
The point is there's people out there that have this album. That album was called I Promise. That was the mm -hmm. I Promise album. And then I'm going to jump a little bit. Of, I'm going to jump the time frame a little bit. But yes, you brought up me going to Hong Kong and, and then doing music in Cantonese and stuff like that. That Yeah, that's all part of this whole process. So from basically from 2006 onward, I was fully switched into this mode of, yo, just DIY. Uh, even when I recorded the uh, my first Cantonese album, uh, uh, you know, there was no label backing. There was no like... You know, there wasn't like a, a entity saying, hey, we're going to throw this amount of money into you to do this project. I just basically was like, yo, I feel inspired to do an album in Cantonese. And then I did it. <laughs> yep. Then, then you had you had a few, uh, you know, I. I went from a point, you know, I, I used to be in the YouTube comments and, you know, you, you had your haters, you know, cats oh, like, yeah. oh, he's, he's not a good in Cantonese, you know, you know, stuff like yeah, that. And yeah, I was like, yeah, hey, yeah. He, he's actually making it work. In, in my opinion, uh -huh. you know, uh, yeah. you know, I didn't understand everything, but it was yeah. like, you know, I, I felt that you were making it work. Um, and, and that's that's like an important part of business. Like you switch, you know, locations. You know, uh -huh. So now now you having to attend to another audience that you're trying to build with, yeah. you know, uh, and, and I believe you, you've you always had, you know, a lot of um, Asians that have supported you. Oh, but now, for sure. you're, you're, now you're in China, you know, and it's like you, you felt that you had to uh, to switch that up to attend to that new audience as well. Uh, could you explain yeah. a little bit about that? Just kind of like, uh, I mean, obviously you felt inspired to do so. Yeah. But what did you feel like changed for for you, like as far as with your entrepreneurship and business when you when you made that? Oh, switch man, that? I think, um, you know, what worked for me was that at least I hope people just always saw the authenticity of what I was doing. That's what I hope, even if it didn't come up, even if it didn't get traction right away, because to be honest, when I first started doing music in Cantonese, like you just mentioned, there was definitely people that's like, yo, man, like, you know, what is this? You know, like his Cantonese isn't the best. If we want to listen to Cantonese rhymes, there's definitely better ones out there. So you had that type of response. But I think for me, I was just coming from a place of expression, right? I was like, in my mind, at least my Cantonese rhymes might not be the dopest, but I know I wrote them, right? I know mm -hmm. that every line you hear, I know that every thought being conveyed is coming from within me. So I think that worked for me because for the people that did appreciate it, they appreciated it that much more. Um, and then even um, for a long time, people were like, yo, why don't you also rap in Mandarin? Like if you rap in Mandarin, that's all of China. And I was just like, number one, I don't speak Mandarin. I don't know it. <laughs> so how am I even going to rap in it, right? Um, so there was a, a period of time where people really were like, yo, man, if you rap in Mandarin, that's the way, that's the way. And once again, that's why I say the, the whole organic uh, like just the idea of keeping things organic really worked for me is that it wasn't up until where I personally felt compelled. And I was like, yo, you know what? I do want to try to rap in Mandarin. So I'm going to take some Mandarin classes. I'm going to try to, you know, like just, just, you know, start from the ground up and, um, and, 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 and attempt to do it. And then, yeah, in the last year or two, I've also like, I haven't done a whole album, but I definitely, uh, uh, had releases where it was straight up in Mandarin. And once again, that kind of opens the market a bit. But I think that's the point is that I never really approached it like, yo, I'm trying to tap into this market, or I'm trying to tap into that market. Even when I did the, um, the, the Cantonese album, and, and, you know, it brought me to Hong Kong, my mindset was, yo, I'll come out here, I'll, I'll get the most out of the experience, might be two months, three months, do a few shows, see whatever I could get. And if it doesn't connect, then it doesn't connect. I made peace with that. But yo, not only did it connect, but it opened a lot more doors for me, you know? And I would mm -hmm. say that in the course of this whole thing, from 106 in Park, all the way to Hong Kong and back and everything in between, uh, my biggest takeaway is just, yo, financial wisdom management um, is key in everything. Like it's key. Uh, uh, I think there's so much emphasis on making money, making money, making money. So in this case, we're talking about my rap career, but I think it could be applied to anything. It's just the culture is like, yo, we got to make money. We got to make money. But I think that if, if it's not just as important, but probably even more is actually what do you do after you've made it, after you've made some, right? So forget about if it's a, a decent amount, a huge amount, forget about how much it is, but 
once you've obtained some of the financial security or, 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 or your first, you know, kind of uh, your first bucket of, of, of gold, right? There's a Chinese phrase. They actually, it's actually called that in Chinese, which means your first bucket of gold. It's literally translated. But the idea of it is that, yeah, you, you have your first bucket of gold. What do you do with it? So I think that be to me has been gold literally on my show. I'll be talking about. Uh, there you go. Gold. Yeah, <laughs> Absol <laughs> absolutely. My audience but, know that hits home right there. <laughs> there you go. I mean, you know, um, I'm trying to think of uh, a lyric. I remember there being a lyric about it. I'm trying to remember who said it, like a rap lyric. Oh, no, no, no. I'm thinking of an outcast lyric where he, uh, I think it was Big Boy. It might be Big Boy or Andre, but they said, it's not where you're from. It's not where you at. So, so yeah, so that's not, that doesn't apply. I think there's one more lyric though that is from Outkast. Uh, oh, it's not what you make, but what you spent or something like that. So I, I'm mm -hmm. going to Google it after we hang up. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, sure. I thought of that. I thought of that line just because I do agree that, yo, it's not, it's not what you make is how you spend it. It's not what you make, but it's how much you're able to, 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 to retain and how much can you continue to sustain and, and make after you've made something, you know? And I'm yeah. just very fortunate that, Yo, I've made some money, you know, and this is as straightforward and, and layman's terms as I could put it. I've made some money. Uh, I've blown some money. I've blown a lot of it. And, you know, you know, luckily I'm able to make some again. And now I'm in a mm -hmm. space where it's like, now I'm in a space where it's like, you know, if I were to make more, I know the, 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 the things to avoid and I know the things to, you know, to aspire for. So that's kind of where I'm at. Definitely. So, so a couple things with that, yeah. um, you know, uh, I know, so one thing that I've been like really telling my audience is, is like, okay, how do we begin to make our money work for us? How do we free mm. up time to be able mm. to spend time with our families to be able to, yes. um, you know, all that. And, and, you know, that's, that's why I've been leaning harder on the entrepreneur side, you know, because yeah, being able to have mobility and, and, uh, you know, your schedule and being able to connect with your family and, and make sure that you're, you're in your family's lives and stuff like that. How do you feel that's, that's been working out for you? Oh man, I've been super blessed in that area. Uh, there were, de there's definitely sacrifice involved. Definitely. Um, so could have put a bit of context in it. We have two little boys. Uh, we have an eight year old uh, and we have a 18 month old. So uh, a toddler, essentially. So with our firstborn, the eight-year-old, pretty much from the moment he was born, um, I, I was here, right? I was able to come back home and be home for his arrival. But literally within a, a maybe two weeks or so after he was born, I had to go back out for work, right? I had to go back out to Asia, be back on, a, I think I was working on a, a project at the time, like an acting project. And I had to be away for like, a month and a half, two months, things like that. And it was tough, you know, it was, but you know, me, my, I'm, I'm grateful. My wife is also very on board, you know, like mm -hmm. she, she basically has known me and my world way before we got married and had a family and things like that. So none of this is catching her off guard. Right. So she's very aware of the type of world and lifestyle that comes with this line of work. Um, you know, so she's on board and, you know, we take turns encouraging each other. Right. Sometimes it's like, she'll be the one that's like, you're away for two and a half months, but think about the, the flip side of that. After you do this two and a half months, you, you know, you, you're able to be home for, uh, let's say four months, right? Where you can fully invest into the home front. So, so, you know, we just know that that's, that's, that's our reality, right? And then the flip side of it is you'd rather be away for two and a half months than not be away for two and a half months if that means, you know, this is our livelihood, right? And this is how yeah, yeah. we keep a roof above our heads and how we can sustain and, and provide a comfortable life for our family. So, you know, overall, um, especially right now in the, the current time frame that we're living in, I think um, we're in a good space. We're right in the middle where, you know, we, we still have dreams and aspirations. Like for me, I still have goals and things that I want to achieve uh, career-wise, financial-wise. However, it's definitely not that space where it's like, you know, dang, how are we going to keep the lights on for the next month? You know, which I know is, is, is a lot of scenarios for a lot of people out there. Right. And, and this is why, like, I have a newfound appreciation, not that I ever didn't, not that I ever saw them as lower, 
but now I definitely see them as higher. Uh, and when I say them, I'm just referring to people that are just willing to go out there, roll their sleeves up and just get the job done, you know? And, yeah. and I'm talking specifically about the less than glamorous jobs, right? That at least society paints these jobs to be less than glamorous. The bus drivers, the custodians, uh, you know, mm. the, we, you know, this, especially with this past year with the pandemic, you know, we've been, you know, lifting up essential workers, right? Yeah, you know, absolutely. You know, we're talking about frontline, like doctors, medical people, nurses, firefighters, those, those people are, to me, those are like modern day Avengers, right? But yeah, I think, definitely. but I think just the general scope of, yo, the, the young, the young lady that's at the drive through window at, at, um, you know, at the fast food spot, you know, the, the, the guy that's at, you know, the electronics store, when you go in and you're like, you know, those, you, you don't know. Some people, they look at those jobs and they cherish it. And, and they maybe, they put them all of themselves into those jobs. And, and I appreciate it and I commend them. But I also know a lot of people that are miserable in those jobs too, you know? Because just like you were saying, they got to put so many hours into that. And after putting hours into it, they're probably just making it. You know, meaning like they're not even able to, to spend that type of quality time that you were describing. But in their minds, they're like, this is what I got to do. I'm going to do it you know, and, and I have my whole hearted, like salute and admiration to, to individuals with that type of mindset. Definitely. Definitely. Well, Jen, just yeah. to, just to wrap us up, uh, you know, I, sure. I really appreciate how, you know, uh, how you uh, with your business you know you started communicating with a lot of the fans you know you and i we started emailing each other back and forth back in was it 2011 or 12 yeah, um, yeah it, was, it was a while ago so you know and you you actually you know came down to people's level you know i, I don't know how you kept up with all them emails but like you and i <laughs> we were back and forth, you know talking yeah, and stuff yeah, yeah. and yeah. um and then, you know, when you reached out uh, recently, you know, I was like, I was like, oh, I was like, I was like, Jen, Jim, you know, he either remembered me or he found he found our emails or something. I was like, I was like, what the <laughs> heck happened? You know? Yeah, yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's that's a big part of, you know, people that have achieved like your type of success. And, and you know, uh, people want to know that that, you know, you're down to earth, that you're not untouchable you know, and, and things like that. And so that, that's something that I, I definitely appreciate about you. And, and what do you feel like that's done for like, you know, your career um, since kind of switching that mindset? I, I, I can assume like when you, you know, when you were a rough rider, you, you may have had a, a big head on your shoulders, but I, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's interesting. I think, um, did I ever have uh, a big head? You know, like I, I, I like to think that I always um, was accessible. Like even at the mm -hmm. pinnacle, like quote unquote pinnacle, even at the peak, even when I was at the top of the world, you know, killing it on 106, just getting a deal and every, you know, the, 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 you know, the, the life of the party, even at that point, I like to think that I was accessible. Um, I believe, and, and this is by the grace of God, totally by yeah. the grace of God. I never looked down on anybody. I never felt like, yo, because I am where I'm at, I'm greater than you and, and you're below me. Yeah, maybe maybe in a battle, right? Like maybe in, in that yeah, context, yeah. right? Like when you're battling, you have you kind of have to do that, right? But I'm talking <laughs> about as far as like literally feeling like I'm better than anyone as a human being, or I have more worth than anyone. I've never felt that, and I don't care if you're Asian, not Asian, like anyone, like you know whatever color you are, whatever background, whatever socioeconomic standing you are. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for that. And that's a, 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 a blessing from God. That's, that's by God's grace that I feel like mm -hmm. I've always maintained that, but for sure, for sure. I do think that, you know, um, the higher I, uh, climbed in terms of my career achievements, right. At that time, there definitely was a, a, a era of gin where I felt like, yo, I'm, you know, I'm greater than I am. Right. Like meaning like, mm -hmm. yo, I feel like, yeah, y'all better show me love, right? Y'all better give me yeah. my props. Y'all better give me my respect. Y'all know who I am. I, I, I definitely acknowledge and admit that, right? Because I think it's a combination of, uh, it, it's so much embedded in hip hop culture, right? There's really like, to be honest, uh, hip hop has, has, has taught me a lot, but I think the initial days of it definitely taught me more about um, just confidence but that confidence easily becoming just like 
you know, uh, uh, um, a pretend, not pretentious, but you just feel like, yeah, y'all know I'm nice, like that type of yeah, thing, yeah. right? Yeah, definitely. But at the same time, yo, hip hop's definitely taught me about humility, without a doubt. Mm -hmm. It's taught me about, you know, humility and and having to really look inside and, and see like, man, who are you? You know what I mean? Like, what are your values? What do you stand for? What do you believe in, you know? And, you know, I'm talking about hip hop, but in, in that sense, I think hip hop is just a tool that God has definitely utilized in my life, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely, definitely. Well, well, appreciate you coming on today. Um, could you, uh, I know you started a new uh, Instagram and, and uh, I know you got oh, yeah, a website. But people, yeah, stuff. they could, um, so, you know, MC Jin, uh, I am MC Jin is my IG. You can hit me up there. Um, uh, mcgin.com uh I, I maybe it's time for a, a relaunch because that 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 website it just leads you to like my youtube page i think if you go to mcgin.com but yeah uh mm -hmm. i'm on ig uh, i am mcgin so you can people can find me there but yo congrats to you man I'm, I'm very happy for you that you have this this path and and, and this direction that you found and it's dope, man. You know, to know that yeah, 10 plus years ago, we, we, you know, we communicated on emails and we've never even met actually. Right. I don't think we've ever no, met no, no. in person. Right. Yeah. But you know, mm -hmm. to know from that point up to now, both of us have probably been through a whirlwind of experiences and it's glad I'm glad we get to connect like this. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's been a, you know, a passion of mine. And, you know, uh, uh, I was talking with a friend the other day and he was talking about how, uh, Jesus spoke more about economics and money than he did heaven and hell, you mm. know? And I was like, I was like, huh? I was like, you know, I kind of began thinking back, you know, like, you know, all these different parables and, you know, stuff yeah. like that. And I was like, yeah, oh, yeah he did talk about it a lot. So that was kind of yeah. something that, you know, I, I want to help people do is like, how do we achieve the financial freedom together? How do we, absolutely? You know, uh, how do we become our own bosses? How do we free up time so we can live out our dreams and live out our callings and, and all of that? So yeah, it's definitely been a passion, man. Cool, man. All the best with it, man. Continue all the best to you and your fam in 2021 too. All right, for sure, for sure. Appreciate you, bro. Right. Y'all take care. Money levels. Yeah. Peace.